I want you to not frown. Okay. I want to address something that uh, hits us all very deeply right now, especially with the uh, coronavirus epidemic that's happening in our world. And that is the fact that we have lost six trillion dollars of wealth out of our economy. Now wealth is not the same thing as money, although the two are very uh, much tied up together. But there's a couple of misconceptions we might have about wealth. The first one is that a person who lives paycheck to paycheck, or as we say, hand to mouth, is not necessarily wealthy, no matter how big his paycheck is. Somebody might make $150,000 a year, someone else might make uh, $250,000 a year, and if they just spend the money, they are not necessarily wealthy. They might live pretty well, but if they were to lose that paycheck, uh, they become poor very quickly. The other misconception we have is that the wealthy are the only ones who benefit from their wealth. When I was a kid, I used to read Donald Duck comic books, and of course, uh, Donald Duck has a very wealthy, fabulously wealthy uncle, Uncle Scrooge. And Uncle Scrooge keeps all his money in a building that's four or five stories tall and covers about a half a city block, and he calls it his money bin. And every now and then he goes into the money bin and he just kind of, you know, throws money up in the air and has fun with it. But the reality is that the wealth that people accumulate in many cases goes into the general economy and it employs people uh, and it's available through the banking system for people who need to borrow that money to build buildings, to build all kinds of things, to invest in small businesses. So the idea that the wealthy are just hanging on to that wealth is a misconception. And when the wealthy lose a great deal of their wealth, it affects us all. Just a few people that you might, a few names you might recognize, uh, Jeff Bezos uh, of Amazon, has just in the last uh, few uh, months lost close to five billion dollars. But don't worry about him, he still has 121 billion dollars left, you know, for his pocket money. Bill Gates, uh, the founder of Microsoft, uh, has lost about two billion dollars of his fortune, but he still has 114 billion. So he's going to be okay. And Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook has lost a little over $3 billion. Uh, and I don't know what his total fortune is, but uh, it's considerable. And he's going to be all right. Uh, but that money that is lost from their portfolios is no longer in the general economy. It's not doing anybody any good. Now we might think of this maybe as a good thing. Those dirty, rotten, fat cats are getting what they deserve. We might think of uh, this as their, getting their comeuppance. Or that only the rich get hurt. Now just a little illustrative story. Uh, it was oh, 20 or so years ago. One of the eastern seaboard states decided they needed some money. They were getting short. They had spent more than they had. So they had a great idea. Let's tax the yacht industry. Only yachts, only rich people buy yachts. So rich people are the only ones who are going to pay this tax. This tax was uh, particularly onerous. So they the legislature passed this tax and they uh, projected that they were going to 
make uh, many millions of dollars on this tax, uh, and only the rich were going to pay the tax. But something unforeseen happened. The rich quit buying yachts. The tax was too much. The per people that got hurt were the yacht builders, people who made these luxurious boats. Well, you might think that was only maybe 50 to 100 people put out of work. That doesn't hurt too much. Well, all the vendors that supplied materials to those yacht builders, they got put out of work. We knew a couple that had a nice little uh, home-based business selling hardware to yacht builders. You know, you can't just use a regular bolt on a yacht. You know, if you go to Home Depot and buy a bolt for a yacht, it will corrode away in a matter of a couple of years. So you have to buy very special metal alloy bolts to go in the yachts that you're building. And they had a nice little business supplying these special metal alloy bolts and nuts and various fasteners and fittings. And it put them out of business. And not only that, the state that was expecting a windfall of many millions of dollars from this tax actually caused a net loss in revenue from this great idea that only the rich were gonna pay this tax. We need to look at some of the things that are happening now. I heard that the other day that Las Vegas had shut down all the casinos because of the coronavirus. And you might say, well, it serves those rich casino owners right. They're getting theirs. But the city of Las Vegas has had to lay off a third of their police force. Just the cops that are out there protecting uh, the good people of Las Vegas are now out of work. And this is happening throughout uh, the city employment. When we look at sporting events that have been canceled. Well, these sporting events, these uh, big uh, facilities that cities buy to house uh, their favorite teams, their local teams, are uh, providing revenue to operate the city. College sports raises a lot of money for colleges. This is money that has gone away. Special events and concerts are being canceled and money is being lost. People who work in the convention centers and places where these events go on uh, are losing employment. Vendors who, you know, the guy who prints the tickets for the concert, he's lost that revenue. A great many people are affected. And some of us are even worrying about making our next house payment. Jesus had a lot to say about wealth. In fact, throughout uh, not only the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well. A guy came to Jesus and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain an eternal life? And he said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one good, but if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. And then he said, Which ones? Uh, which commandments shall I keep? And Jesus said, You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, All these things I have kept. What am I still lacking? I've done all that. And Jesus said to him, Well, since you've done all that, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. But it says, when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, 
for he was one who owned much property. He had much wealth. He made a decision right then and there what was more important. And Jesus says to his disciples, I can just imagine this guy is just walking away and Jesus turns to his disciples and says, pay attention here. Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now they lived in a culture that believed that if you were wealthy, a person who was wealthy, uh, was especially blessed by God. And Jesus came to set them straight. He says, when the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, who then can be saved? If the rich, who are especially blessed, don't enter the kingdom of God, then who does? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, with people, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So it's not that rich or poor are blessed or not blessed or cursed. We've gotten this idea in our culture that the wealthy uh, have a special curse on them. It's actually totally opposite of what uh, it was like in the days of Jesus. The wealthy are cursed and the poor are specially blessed, that there is some merit in being poor. I think the point that Jesus was making here was that that's not the point. The point is that rich and poor are equally under condemnation and have an equal access to the salvation that he is offering, the entrance into the kingdom of God. We see a lot of wealthy people in the Old Testament. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they were all wealthy men, probably wealthier than we usually think of them. We think of them as, you know, living out in the desert in tents, which they certainly did. Uh, but the situation may be a little different than you might think. There was that one incident where these four guys, four kings, uh, the king of Elam, the king of Goim, the king of Shinar, and the king of Elisar, came and attacked the cities on the plain, uh, Sodom, Gomorrah, and the other three, uh, where Lot was living. And they took Lot captive. And it says, when Abraham heard that his relative had been taken captive, he led out his trained men. Abraham has trained men, military type trained men. They're born in his house, 318. 318 personal bodyguards that Abraham had. And he went in pursuit as far as Dan. And it says that he brought back all the goods and also brought back his relative Lot with his possessions and also the women and the people. Abraham went out with these bodyguards that he had. Well, what did he need these bodyguards for? Well, it tells us just back a chapter. It says, Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journeys, plural, from the Negev as far as Bethel. Evidently, Abraham had a trade route that he followed. He probably had donkeys and camels loaded with goods. And in those days, uh, there was not a police force policing the roads. You had to have your own. So Abram is uh, involved in uh, trading as a merchant and he has to uh, have his own small army to protect his caravans along the way. So if God especially blessed Abraham in his wealth, it appears that uh, uh, the poor are not especially blessed uh, that God chose a wealthy man, an entrepreneur, to uh, be the bearer of his promises. 
The book of Proverbs has a lot to say about wealth. Proverbs 10, 15 says, The rich man's wealth is his fortress, and the ruin of the poor is their poverty. So a rich man feels secure in his wealth, that his wealth is going to protect him from the capriciousness of life. And a poor man might consider himself uh, to be oppressed in his poverty or feelings of inadequacy or I'm just not as good as that guy. Proverbs 10, 16 says, The wages of the righteous is life. The righteous, not the rich. And the income of the wicked is punishment. True riches come to rich and poor or available to rich and poor alike through God's blessing. Proverbs 18, verse 10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, not riches. And the righteous runs into it and is safe. Towers were built uh, to protect from enemies. When enemies appeared, everybody would run into the tower, uh, which were built strongly, made of stone, uh, and you were up above the, the enemy, and you could uh, survive an attack. Some people were given to think that their wealth provided a strong tower. But it says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. A rich man's wealth is his strong city. At least he imagines it so like a high wall in his own imagination. So riches provide a refuge only in the imagining. Proverbs 11 tells us that riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. In the day of God's wrath, which many places in the scripture tells us it is coming, that there is a day when God is going to do away with all of the unrighteousness of man in the day of wrath. And wealth is not going to be any defense against it. And that day is coming. Proverbs 23, 4 says, Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. So accumulation of wealth requires time, requires effort, and it brings worry. Worrying about the loss of wealth uh, keeps you up at night. I've experienced that. Years ago, we had about a $200,000 loss in our business. On top of that, we had a company that we owed some money to that was coming after us for about another quarter of a million on top of that. And I don't want to bore you with all the details, but we spent many sleepless nights, but I kept coming back to the same, the same comforting thought. What can they take away from me? They can't take my family. They can't sell my wife and children into slavery. They might take my house and my car. Uh, they can't take my relationship with the Lord away. Uh, that is secure. And that is where security must be found. Paul says to Timothy that we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. There's a funny story about a guy who somehow negotiated with God that he could take one suitcase full of earthly goods with him when he left. I don't know how he did that, but it doesn't really enter into the story. But he comes to uh, St. Peter with a suitcase full of gold. 
Well, that's a pretty good trick in itself. You know, I have uh, held a bar of gold in my hands, and one bar of gold weighs about 75 pounds. So stuffing the suitcase uh, with gold is going to weigh about a ton. But he struggles and manages to get that uh, suitcase full of gold up to uh, St. Peter's podium at the gates of heaven, as it's you know proverbial, proverbially imagined, with his suitcase full of gold. And Peter says, what do you got there? And he says, well, I, I negotiated with God. And he said, I could bring this one suitcase uh, with me. And he says, well, what is it? And he says, it's gold. And he said, so you got permission to bring one suitcase full and you brought pavement? We value sometimes things that have no value. In heaven, gold has no value. Only on earth do, do our material measures of wealth have any value at all. Paul tells Timothy again, he says, instruct those who are rich in this present world. He said, he didn't say he condemned those who are rich, those members of the church who are wealthy. He says, those who are rich in this present world, not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Don't fix your hope in your wealth. Don't spend time on your wealth, fixing that as the hope of your life. You have no guarantee of a long life. You have no guarantee of a happy life. You have no guarantee of health in this life. There is no hope in riches. It's said that money cannot buy happiness uh, it can't really buy much of lasting value at all. Here's where our hope should be. Paul tells in Titus, says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of, our, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our hope is not in you know, the formation of some new and more equitable economic system. Uh, it's not in that government check that we've been promised that some of us uh, are still waiting for. Uh, our hope is in Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. That's where our hope is to be, in Jesus Christ. Not even in the church. You know, building a big and better church building uh, hiring a, a better, more professional worship team, uh, doing all those wonderful things that uh, we think uh, is, are, are important in church today. There's no hope in any of those things. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And I want to, to leave you with this. Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows what you need, that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen.